Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ever since I landed on Irish shores in 1975 with a flannel shirt, a full beard, and hair past my shoulders, truly, I've been in love with all things Irish, and this island in particular. And so I'd like to begin by thanking you not only for that encounter, but the encounter since. It's with particular shame and embarrassment that I say to our host here in Northern Ireland that this is my maiden voyage to this part of the world, but I should say that the artists who have ventured across the pond, like Seamus Heaney and Brian Friel, Liam Nesson and Kenneth Branagh, C.S. Lewis and Joyce Carey, Van Morrison and the Brown Eyed Girl have all been deeply influential to me over the years. And so I want to begin by thanking all of you for your part in encouraging, nurturing, and promoting Irish artists, encouraging those that I, whose work I have yet to see, and thanking you for the work of the extraordinary artists you will produce and nurture in the years to come. It's my honor to be with you all. To the hopes that have been expressed for our gathering today, let me just add one of my own that I hope in the days to come we will all evince the path to creativity as explained by Adri Angelus Arian when she said, you know, creativity is a four-step process. To be creative, you show up, really show up, senses vibrating, tingling. You listen deeply, you speak the truth, and you let go of predetermined results. A path that I hope we will follow not only in this session, but in the days and weeks to come. You know, in the wake of the global financial crisis, a.k.a. the GFC, artists and arts organizations in the United States have entered a perilous new chapter, a chapter which has shaken philanthropy at every level, which has seen significant erosion of government support at the state, at the federal, and at the local level, and which has redefined resources for many organizations, leading them to a range of responses, including downscaling or eliminating entirely productions or exhibits, reducing performance weeks, resorting more frequently to small cast plays, hiring freezes, staff furloughs, uh, layoffs, eliminating retirement and health care benefits, engaging in fundraising, emergency campaigns, all to forestall the worst possible scenario, declaring bankruptcy and shuttering the doors forever. That said, I would suggest that we disserve ourselves wherever we are if we define the ultimate crisis we face as financial. Indeed, I'd humbly suggest that in the arts, the ultimate crisis we face is not financial at all. To explain what I mean, in 2006, two years before the GFC, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, where I work, assembled more than 700 artists, technicians, and managers in 22 meetings across the United States to identify the challenges and problems that were keeping us all up at night. And yes, while we heard about chronic issues of undercapitalization and undercompensation, while we heard idiosyncratic issues particular to every field, we heard at least three issues that seemed particular to the 21st century that threatened to dismantle business practices and the art form as it has come to be known. These three burning issues were as follows. Number one, an impending generational transfer of leadership as the current generation of leaders retires or moves on. And while for many years, people my age in their 60s have said, where are we going to find the young people who want long hours, bad pay, <laughs> the lives of financial and social masochism with which we have contented ourselves? <laughs> what we heard in this conversation from young people was quite different. There are more than enough of us ready and willing to lead your organizations, they said. The problem is we don't want to be the custodians of that thing you already made. Unless you give us the same degree of power and autonomy to reshape and change the organizations that you had in making them, we're not interested. A perspective that means the real issue is not the identity of the heir apparent. The real issue is organizational capacity for flexibility and change. Issue number two. Two years before the GFC, we heard about mystifying changes in audience behavior. Audience erosion in every field, declining subscription rates, the difficulties in attracting single ticket buyers, increased churn, the industry term for audience turnover, with as much as 75% of dance audiences in the US now coming for one event in an entire year and not coming back again. An enormous number when you calculate how many different people you have to reach to balance your budget. We heard about the impact of a time which we already faced a populace characterized by overscheduling and exhaustion. 
a time when 42% of men and 55% of women said, I am too tired to do the things I truly want to do. And the number one answer to what you look forward to on an unscheduled evening was not going to an exhibit or going to a movie or going to a play. The number one answer was, I want a good night's sleep. <laughs> we heard about the collapse of the window of social planning when overnight people went from booking tickets not two weeks in advance or four weeks in advance, but purchasing the day of the performance or if you're lucky, 24 hours or 48 hours in advance. A disorienting shift that plagues box offices and marketing departments who on a Tuesday look at the prospects for an upcoming Saturday performance and try to figure, do we have a dog on our hands? Have we not advertised in the right place? Or is this just the new social rhythm? And if we relax, we'll be sold by Saturday. We don't know. Not surprisingly, in this context, our declining audiences, in tandem with rising fixed costs in labor and insurance and in health care and more, mean escalating ticket prices that threaten to place the arts outside of so many in our communities we want to reach and serve. Finally, we heard a struggle to understand the impact of technology on the live performing arts. You know, while many of us greeted the internet as, boy, here's the cost-effective solution to our marketing problems, we now know, if anything, it's too effective. Too effective. Depending on who you listen to, the typical American now encounters between three and 5,000 different marketing messages every single day. Technology has emerged as our biggest competitor for leisure time. The typical American now spends 25.7 hours online every week uh, online and television, the majority online. And online internet consumption has grown from 8.9 hours to 14.5 hours per week in the last three years alone. By the time a young woman graduates from university, she will have spent 20,000 hours online and an additional 10,000 hours playing video games. A stark reminder that we now operate in a cultural context where in the US, video games outsell movie and music recordings combined. What will this mean, moreover, as our perceptual frameworks shrink, as we have shortened attention spans, and as the way we receive information changes from the linear narrative patterns of my generation to a visual associative pattern fomented by hopping and internet surfing in Sesame Street and more? Indeed, for the theater, what will it mean for an art form, 90% of whose literature is stories told in linear narrative patterns, if increasingly we will be asked to tell those stories to an audience who has been trained to listen in a visual associative way? You know, frankly, moreover, it, the internet is changing our very assumptions of consumption. Thanks to the internet, we think we can get anything we want, any time of day, delivered to our front door. You can shop at three in the morning or three in the afternoon, ordering jeans tailor-made to your own body, delivered to your front doorstep. Expectations of personalization, customization, and convenience that the live performing arts, which have set curtains, set venues, attendant inconvenience of travel, parking, and the like, cannot meet. And what's going to be the response when we say that's 50 pounds for that symphony, opera, or ballet ticket when a young person is used to downloading culture on demand 24 hours a day for 99 cents a song or for free? These are huge issues, and they're not the only issues. Moreover, we experience a dramatic decline in arts education, a blurring of the live digital experience, an emerging recalibration of how much sensory stimulation we need in order to have a satisfying experience. But we are not alone. These are the same issues that are facing the newspaper industry, the publication industry, and has left recorded music distribution in large disarray. Surely, we resonate to the words of Adrian Rich, Adrian Rich, the poet, when she says, we are out in a country that has no language, no laws. Whatever we do is pure invention. The maps they gave us are out of date by years. And so I say to you, the crisis we face is not financial. The crisis we face is a crisis of urgency and relevance. The financially merely redefines the resources we bring to bear.
And aren't you glad you invited me here to brighten your day? <laughs> you know, perhaps what I've described as happening in America doesn't resonate for you. Perhaps you're seeing rising audiences, increased publicity, increased government funding. You're turning people away from your doors. <laughs> but if even one of the things I've described resonates for you in your games, a stark reminder that we now operate in a cultural context where in the U.S. video games outsell movie and music recordings combined. What will this mean, moreover, as our perceptual frameworks shrink, as we have shortened attention spans, and as the way we receive information changes from the linear narrative patterns of my generation to a visual associative pattern fomented by hopping and internet surfing in Sesame Street and more. Indeed, for the theater, what will it mean for an art form, 90% of whose literature is stories told in linear narrative patterns, if increasingly we will be asked to tell those stories to an audience who has been trained to listen in a visual associative way? You know, frankly, moreover, it, the internet is changing our very assumptions of consumption. Thanks to the internet, we think we can get anything we want, any time of day, delivered to our front door. You can shop at 3 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon, ordering jeans tailor-made to your own body, delivered to your front doorstep. Expectations of personalization, customization, and convenience that the live performing arts, which have set curtains, set venues, attendant inconvenience of travel, parking, and the like, cannot meet. And what's going to be the response when we say that's 50 pounds for that symphony, opera, or ballet ticket when a young person is used to downloading culture on demand 24 hours a day for 99 cents a song or for free? These are huge issues, and they're not the only issues. Moreover, we experience a dramatic decline in arts education, a blurring of the live digital experience, an emerging recalibration of how much sensory stimulation we need in order to have a satisfying experience. But we are not alone. These are the same issues that are facing the newspaper industry, the publication industry, and has left recorded music distribution in large disarray. Surely, we resonate to the words of Adrian Rich, Adrian Rich, the poet, when she says, we are out in a country that has no language, no laws. Whatever we do is pure invention. The maps they gave us are out of date by years. And so I say to you, the crisis we face is not financial. The crisis we face is a crisis of urgency and relevance. The financially merely redefines the resources we bring to bear. And aren't you glad you invited me here to brighten your day? <laughs> you know, perhaps what I've described as happening in America doesn't resonate for you. Perhaps you're seeing rising audiences, increased publicity, increased government funding. You're turning people away from your doors. But if even one of the things I've described resonates for you and your organizations, perhaps you'll be inspired, as I often am, by the words of two very different great thinkers. Our 19th century president, Abraham Lincoln, who in his second inaugural address, in a passage quoted by Barack Obama in his first inaugural address, but we hope not his last inaugural address, <laughs> said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so must we think anew and act anew. And that other great thinker, Wayne Gretzky, the Canadian ice hockey player. <laughs> I hear hockey in the house. Okay. <laughs> Who, when asked to account for his greatness as a player, when somebody said, how did you get to be such a great player? He said, You know, it's cold out on that ice. You get your sinuses congested. <laughs> that was actually perfectly timed here. To Thank you so much. Best punchline I've ever had. Now, uh, when, I, when asked to account for his greatness, Wayne Gretzky said, I skate to where the puck will be. How in the arts do we skate to where the puck will be? You know, I think every organization has to begin by asking itself, why must we exist today? 
Because we have a building and a staff and a group of actors is no longer good enough. Because we have a long history and a closet full of critical awards and plaques is no longer good enough. What is it in the world, in the external world, that validates and mandates us to continue to move forward and flourish? You know, for years I've said any smart theater has to be able to answer three questions. Number one, what is the value of my theater for my community? Number two, harder. What's the value my theater alone offers or my theater offers better than anybody else? Because frankly, especially in this economy, duplicated or second-rate value will not stand for long. Third and hardest, how would my community be damaged if we closed our doors and went away tomorrow? If we can't answer those questions, the only supporters we're likely to find already sit in our seats. But frankly, with the passage of time, I've started to worry, boy, are those questions too self-referential? Are they asking us to interpret our community through the lens of our organizations as we know them to be? And so in the new millennium, I'm actually going to suggest there are four better questions. The first, using again theater as an example, challenges the value of the art form. So the question number one is, how does it, what is the value of drama or theater, not my theater company, of the art form for my community? Question two, what is the value theater alone offers or offers better than anything else? Question three, how would my community be damaged if deprived of theater tomorrow? And question four, how might my organization be best poised, structured, and operate to be my community's ideal conduit into the theater? A question that invites us not to jettison everything we do, but yes, get rid of those things that aren't working, seize those things that are showing promise, and let's expand our vision to embrace possibilities we may not have seen heretofore. You know, as an occasional student of history, I often believe the past can illuminate the future. And I was deeply inspired at the ISPA conference in New York several years ago when a member of the audience actually stood up and said, you know, what would we do differently if we thought the moment we're experiencing is the equivalent of the 15th century religious reformation in Europe? What if we're really engaged in the very first steps of an arts reformation? I thought that was an incredibly rich image to ponder. You know, those of you who know the Reformation know that the Reformation was occasioned by changes in technology. The inventing of the printing press suddenly meant anybody could get access to a Bible. A tract nailed on the door in Germany could be seen in France two days later. And God knows we're in the middle of a technological revolution and a massive redistribution of knowledge. Moreover, as Russell Willis Taylor has said, the religious reformation upended and destroyed the old economic models. As, she's, as she has observed, the reformation was a great time to be a land buyer and a rotten time to be a monastery. <laughs> and on some level, we've got to ask ourselves, are our theaters, our orchestras, and our opera companies structured in a way that makes them the monastic order of today? But on a third and really ultimate level, I think at its heart, the religious reformation questioned this necessity of intermediation in a divine spiritual experience. Why do I need a priest to intercede for me to God? A question that's finding direct parallel today in a world in which the necessity of a professional artist to have a creative experience is now equally under assault. Chris Anderson, the author of The, the Long Tale, a book I hope you know, was actually the first to point out that one of the consequences of technology was the unleashing of a tsunami of creative energy. According to Anderson, thanks to software, internet, mini cams, computerware, and more, for the first time in human history, the means to artistic creation have been democratized. In the 1920s or 30s, if you wanted to make a movie, you had to work for Warner Brothers or RKO or British Films because who could afford sound stages and sound scoring and lighting equipment and more? Now, who in this room doesn't know a 14-year-old hard at work on her second, third, or fourth film? <laughs> Moreover, as he points out, the means to artistic distribution have been democratized. Again, MGM RKO did that for you. Now, go to your bedroom, upload your film into YouTube or, or Facebook. You have worldwide distribution without leaving your own home. With that explosion of technology has come a redefinition of the cultural market as we shift from a market defined by uh, consumption 
to one now increasingly defined by participation. We're seeing the emergence of a group called the Pro-Ams, amateur avocational citizens doing work at a professional level. We see their work on YouTube, in dance festivals, in film competitions, and more at one end. And at the other end, the emergence of what we call hybrid artists, professionally highly trained artists who are working with avocational citizens, Groups like Cornerstone Theater, which works with disenfranchised communities to reinterpret classics and productions in which common citizens play the lead role and the professionals the support. Or Liz Lerman's dance company, who works with communities to develop their own vocabulary with the professional dancers, ranging in age from 18 to 82, playing supporting roles. Artists who work outside of a traditional arts context, not for economic necessity but because they fundamentally believe the work they are called to do cannot be accomplished in the traditional concert hall, opera house, or theater. These groups are exploding our sense of aesthetic possibilities, even as they are undermining the presumed ability of arts institutions to set the cultural agenda. Now, if you think I'm basically saying this is the end of institutions and artists, let me be clear. To return to that Reformation image, the religious Reformation did not spend the end of the Catholic Church, a church which continues to be deeply meaningful to millions worldwide. And I think the best of our institutions will continue to be deeply meaningful as they too provide meaningful spiritual experiences to others. Whatever we do, we have to be thoughtful about nurturing and preserving those institutions because they offer the best chance of lives of economic dignity for our artists and the logical place where artists who work at a certain scale must find a home. But like the Catholic Church, these will be less in number and less dominant of the philanthropic and cultural landscape. And so what I say to you is whichever side of that equation you fall in on, we have to ask ourselves some hard questions. What if our mission is no longer to produce plays but social orchestration? An orchestration in which the performance is a piece, but only a piece of what we're called to do. What if our job is no longer to produce products to be consumed, but to provide experiences that will be springboards to our audience's own creativity? Can we think of our organizations not as self-contained institutions, but as platforms that are designed to aggregate creative energy? Can we increasingly think of the arts as, a, as in the world rather than apart from the world, speaking with the world in dialogue rather than at the world or to the world, a universe that mirrors in business practice the same degree of innovation, curiosity, and experimentation that our aesthetics often seek to impart? You know, recognizing this moment that we face as a fundamental recalibration of the arts industry, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation has been explicitly supporting organizational or business innovation as part of our priority. Now for a lot of people, while innovation means oh, big or flashy or fast or not planned or whatever associations it can bring. For us, innovation has a precise three-part definition first offered by Richard Evans when he says, innovation is the following. Number one, new pathways to mission fulfillment a reminder that innovation is deeply connected to our core purpose. Secondly, it's discontinuous from previous practice or in driving terms. It's a hard right, it's not a gradual left. And third, it springs from changes in underlying organizational assumptions. A marketing or publicity department that says, oh, there's a new thing called the internet, we better get online so we can mail to everybody electronically our brochures or our advertising are not really innovators, they're adapters, adapting to a new technology to fulfill old jobs. A marketing department that says, oh, there's a thing called the internet, we've got to ship these out, but at the same time says, but what we hear back from people will be more important than what we send out, fundamentally changes the assumption of marketing from broadcast to conversation. And with that change in the underlying organiz organizational assumption, opens the door for innovation. Now, as we think about innovation, there are two different kinds of innovations that may be useful to think about. Jerry and Monique Sternin and Richard Pascal in their book Positive Deviance, Deviance with a C-E, not Deviance with a T-S, how unlikely innovators solve the world's toughest problems. 
talk about how they were called upon to solve child malnutrition in Vietnam. After decades of futile attempts led by scientists and policymakers and more, the Sternans traveled to South Vietnam and held community meetings, not unlike this one, where they asked people to self-identify as who's well-off, who's struggling, who's poor, who's very, very poor. And then they'd turn and say, okay, now who knows a very, very poor child who is not malnourished? Those are the kids we're going to study. They found that non-malnourished, very, very poor children shared three traits in common. Their mothers fed them smaller portions, but more frequently during the day. When the mothers went to ladle the soup that was part of the village staple, they made sure they dug deep to dredge up some of the nutrients that may have settled for the bottom, and which custom often reserved for the village elders. And every day before they left the rice paddies, they'd just lean over, grab a small handful of shrimp or crayfish that lived in the rice paddies, and throw them in the soup. And simply by duplicating and replicating those three changes, villages were able to eliminate child malnutrition entirely. The Sturdens actually draw four lessons from this that are useful to us. Number one, innovators are observable exceptions. It's not that they feel differently or think differently. They behave differently from others, and they have successes where others do not. Second, innovators often don't know they're behaving differently than everyone else. The mothers, when asked about the shrimp and crayfish, said, you mean not everybody does that? But it's not that they're withholding information. They did not realize they had valuable information to share. Number three, in a tenant that's especially warming to funders' hearts like mine, innovators do not succeed because they have more money. It's not that they succeed or innovate because there is more money or more time or more history or grants. These were the very, very poor children that were the breakthrough ideas. Innovators deal with the exact same resources or often worse than non-innovators and have successes where others do not. And fourth and finally, innovators demonstrate that the solutions to seemingly intractable problems already exist in the community itself. If you want to have a great use of the, your two days here, I suggest that every single person you encounter, you turn to and say, what are three things you are now doing in your organization that you weren't doing three years ago that are working for you or that hold promise? Because much of innovation involves shepherding and replicating existing behavior. You know, where I work, I get to see innovation like this all the time. I could give you a long list. The Worcester Group's dailies, a video blog that they produce of two to three minutes every day, often showing office meetings or actors in makeup or rehearsals or whatnot, that now draws an audience of more than 30,000 people who visit that 20 times a, a month, it, which has led to a 40% increase in earned revenue and a 20% decrease in their marketing costs at the same time. I could talk to you, uh, this list goes on and on here, Home for Contemporary Art, how artists work with audience, et cetera. But I want to give you two examples in a little more detail, one from an organization trying to remake itself, another a new organization unencumbered by past practice that's beginning with an entirely new set of, of assumptions. The first, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, or the SPCO, as it's often called, is attempting as radical a redefinition of structural behavior as any organization, I think, in the world. As I said to somebody I met today who's an orchestra manager, as hard as I always thought we had it in the theater, boy, I would open a vein before I would try to run an, uh, an orchestra. <laughs> oh my lord, the problems they have with that entrenched labor force. We all know, if you know these things, the orchestra musicians are the least happy labor pool of anybody in the arts. <laughs> I mean, we have the studies that prove it. They all wanted to be soloists. It didn't happen for them. <laughs> And now they're in a context where somebody says, this is what you're going to play, this is how you're going to play it, this is where you're going to play it, with no say at all. They're a not happy group, group of campers. <laughs> the SPCO began their journey by redefining their mission, moving away from the classic, we call it a McMission statement, because it's kind of like McDonald's, the classical orchestra McMission statement, which is to be a world-class orchestra playing the symphonic repertoire, an excellence-based mandate to a new mission statement which says our mission is patron development. And what they mean is that not necessarily financial patient, but patrons, but our job is to find people who have a nominal, if any, interest in the symphonic repertoire and turn them into addicts for that music. A mission shift that leaves you no choice but to change if your audience numbers are going down. 
If your mission is to be a world-class orchestra, you can play to an empty hall and be mission congruent. If your job is patron development, you have no choice but to change if your audience numbers don't rise. They've engaged in a wide variety of solutions. They have abandoned the maestro model. They have no maestro. And instead, they work with six world-class artists on staggered overlapping contracts, Don Upshaw, the soprano being one of them currently, who work directly with the musicians to chart the artistic direction and destiny of the company, one that's animating the musicians in an entirely new way. They've decided that the concert hall is not the venue. It's a venue. It's not the venue. And they play at ballparks and school gymnasiums and church sanctuaries and more, whether in ensembles or quartets or in full orchestra. The board's decided our job is to be agents for change, not guardians of past rituals. They have restructured their financial model with 90% with of tickets being $10 or $20 at, at top and the remaining 10% of tickets being $40. A radical redefinition in an American industry where the average ticket price is more than twice to three times that amount. All of this has been made possible not only by a bold sense of what we can do, but bold senses of what we will stop doing, not only eliminating the maestro position, but no longer doing print advertising at all. They're out of newspapers. They're out of print entirely. Already, they've seen the paid percentage of house skyrocket, and there are a lot of questions on the table. They've gone from 62% to 95% paid capacity for every performance. And there's a lot of questions on the table. Will people come more often at lower prices? We think they will. Will they be more adventurous in what they come to see? We think they will. Will they be less pissed off when they see something they don't like? We think they will. <laughs> if you paid $170 to bring a date to the Philip Glass and you hated it, you are pissed off. <laughs> if you paid $20, and it's a bad movie and on you go. Will they recognize this as a gift and give more charitably? We think they will. Only time will test this, but already preliminary indications are incredibly robust. Now, a different way, of course, was a group called the Trey McIntyre Dance Company. For those of you that may or may not know Trey, Trey is a dance, and please don't worry, these are 22 point font, bold double spaces because of my failing eyes. So. <laughs> Trey McIntyre was a choreographer who worked with major ballet companies in San Francisco, Houston, New York, and Chicago. And three years ago, he decided he wanted his own dance company. And donors in each of those cities said, come here, we will pay for your company if you do. Instead, Trey settled in Boise, Idaho, a community that is more than 600 miles distant from the next major nearest metropolitan area. In order to engage the community of Boise, he began not with billboards or flyers or postcards, he began with what they call spurbans, spontaneous urban events seizing the rationale of the flash mob. In the downtown corridor, suddenly at lunch, dancers would arrive from seven different directions, go, for three minutes, and then disappear into the alleyways, leaving an astonished populace going, what the hell was that? They launched their first performance, not in a theater, but at a drive-in movie theater, where you drive your cars to watch the big screen. Launched with tailgate parties, launched with a documentary where Trey and his company talked not about dance or choreography, but where every individual dancer gave a personal testimonial about this is why I love Boise. A testimonial that had the community in the palm of their hands before they took the first step out. They have inserted themselves into a larger civic agenda in which Boise wants to be the home of innovation. And their managing director, John Michael Shirk, who is also one of their lead dancers, I don't know how he does it, is part of a steering committee for Boise that is composed of the university president, the head of the, she the chief of police, the mayor, the head of the chamber of commerce, and the managing director of a modern dance company, steering the civic agenda for the larger community. They work with the Basque community, an under-recognized uh, part of that world to create dances out of the Basque heritage. For their fundraiser every year, they invite all of the visual artists in the community to paint pictures around the work or the theme of the season, and they do an art auction where the works are sold off and the artists and the organization split the gates. And in my favorite gesture of all, they have crafted an agreement with a downtown bar where the local mixologist, not the bartender, you know, those drinks where you go and you get a martini with muddled basil leaves and urban festive vodka, you know, one of those places. 
where there is a different drink named for each individual member of the dance company. A brilliant strategy that not only gets you past the anonymity of nobody knowing which dancer is which, but that provides a wonderful experience should you ever invent and visit them when they will get you to try to drink your way through the entire company, <laughs> which I'm here to assure you you cannot do. I had a tray and a John Michael and I was under the floor. But in a special arrangement, half of the proceeds for every drink sold go back to support the dance company itself. They are fearless, they are entrepreneurial, they are generous, and in three years, they have emerged already as one of the top five leading organizational modern dance companies in America by virtue of their budget size. And when they left on a 30-week tour recently, the community that had been resistant to their arrival surprised them with a banner in the airport that said, Trey McIntyre and Company, good luck on your journey. All hail our city's best cultural ambassadors. A dramatic turnaround in a three-year period. Now, ultimately, a different kind of school of innovation, I'm going to start throwing these down, is echoed by Steve Johnson in his book, Where, Innovation Come, Where Good Ideas Come From, where he talks about the adjacent possible. Innovation as being successful ideas in an industry lifted over into a new context. Gutenberg, he reminds us, invented the printing press not by hanging out with calligraphers. He was playing with a wine press and winemakers and lifted that into the world of calligraphy. And the single greatest innovation in American performing arts was the subscription model, where you subscribe to a company for a year, a model that came from journalism and was lifted over. Now, these are rarer. They are harder to find, but there's some great ones in the US right now. ACT Theater in Seattle has borrowed a gym membership model, where a patron pays a monthly debit fee that's automatically subtracted on their credit cards that entitles them to come to as many performances as they want to come to in a given month. On the Boards Theater, also in Seattle, has barred a monetizing financial streaming model from uh, uh, Netflix. And in my favorite example, Springboard for the Arts in St. Paul, Minnesota, has adopted a community shares agricultural model. In the US, people will buy shares in an organic farm. And once a month, you go and you pick up your produce. You arrive and you say, oh, look, zucchini. I guess I'll make a spacho or whatever. You go and you're surprised by what's in your box. Springboard has launched a CSA model for artists where once a month you go and you pick up your box of art. Now, they sold all the shares the first year. They doubled the price and doubled the number of artists. They sold it again. And they surround the community pickup with live performances and music and people come. The whole community turns out to see what performances are on hand, what's in the box. And what we're finding is people discover artists in their box they didn't know before. They begin to collect them in new ways. They commission them to do works for their own homes. And Springboard is now saying, what's the equivalent of a CSA for the performing arts? Being deeply attuned to the external world and a vigilant search for the adjacent possible, while being deeply responsive to changes already at work within our own fields, is the ultimate combination that may lead us to innovation and true breakthrough practice and ideas for us all. So as I come into the home stretch, what should we take away from all this? First of all, we must place audiences at the center of our mission. Arts organizations were not invented for artists. They were invented for artists, yes, and audiences, yes, and the art form, yes. And we disserve ourselves and weaken our cause any time we focus on one of those to the exclusion of the other two. Second, we must become adept at change management, a term about how you lead and organize change. You know, we held a meeting within our, our uh, foundation of 10 organizations that are deeply engaged in this kind of organizational change. And in that meeting, one of the CEOs said, you know, I just got to confess, in this effort, my biggest champion is my audience and my community, and my biggest problem is my own staff and my own board. And every head in the room nodded up and down in agreement. <laughs> How do we galvanize and lead change within our organizations? There's not rocket science about this, and if you want to talk more about this, I can because of things I learned in my, in my corporate life. But becoming adept at change management, we must be. Third, we've got to take the long view We've often been on the defensive, short-term view, responding to criticism from the outside, 
But frankly, now with so little on the table from so many sources, now's the time we can take the long view and ask ourselves, if we're successful in our work, what will the world look like in 10 years? And what do we have to start doing to call that world into being? We have to start asking ourselves how we will measure and prove the value we hope to offer and have the courage to face disconfirming data if it comes our way and the courage to change in its wake. Indeed, one of the greatest days I ever had about innovation was at a science university, MIT, best, the leader of innovation in the US, where they said, look, for us, innovation is useful knowledge for solving problems. And at heart, I think we've all got to look at each other and say, if the arts are a way of knowing, as we believe they are, what is the useful knowledge we have and what is the problem we're trying to solve? And fourth and finally, we have to find new ways to work together. You know, in a time when scarcity of resources heightens the competitive urge and makes it so easy for us to turn on one another, either across fields or within fields, we have to elevate this discourse to an arts ecology and realizing that praising theater if we disparage dance or opera, or arguing for the avant-garde while we disparage the mainstream, or pleading the case of the smaller at the expense of the larger, ultimately advantages nobody and disadvantages us all. We have to bypass competition in favor of coopetition, as Barry Nailbuff calls it, cooperating to grow the pie for everyone, even while it's inevitable we'll continue to compete for a piece of it. And regardless of our nationality, we must recognize that we are here joined by common cause. We are all here to promote a healthier, more vibrant world, ameliorate human suffering, nurture a more thoughtful, empathic, substantive, and yes, equitable international order. In his book, The 5%, Steve Coleman says that the world's problems get intractable when three things happen. When we fall into a competitive mode where it's win or lose with nothing in between. Where we oversimplify issues and where we, where we surround ourselves with people who will only reinforce the viewpoint we had before the discussions begin. As apt a discussion of the United States Congress as any I have ever heard in my life. I genuinely believe that we exist to dismantle the intractable. In the face of competition, we emphasize the cooperative. In the place of oversimplification, we nurture nuance and shades of meaning. In the face of a time when ultimately we should be fighting for a piece of it and surrounding ourselves with others like us, we gather people to experience the world other than as we know it, seated beside people who are not like us. And indeed, it's that that leads me to say I am deeply optimistic about the future of the arts in this country, even though I may not have sounded it until now. <laughs> you know, being the Luddite that I am, often looking at my computer as a typewriter with a screen, I decided five years ago I was going to go to high-tech conferences. TED I've been to, clearly. Pop Tech's another one. And when I first went to Pop Tech, which is in a place called Camden, Maine, I was deeply inspired by what I encountered. Now, for those of you who don't know, PopTech is a high-level conference. Technology leaders of all stripe and description. They come together, basically, to hear great thinkers talk about famine, AIDS, drought, warfare, ecological balance, and more. Contrary to my expectations, this is not about startup or financing. Indeed, the common assumption is many of us will not and should not survive. Instead, the discussion was informed by how will we change the world how will we leave this a more ecologically balanced place? How will we eliminate poverty? How will we leave the world a more healthy, equitable, ecologically balanced, nourishing place than the one we inherit? Indeed, in the world of high tech, there is an unwritten assumption. There is nothing we cannot do. And truly, in this world of infinite possibility, there is infinite solution for those of us in the arts. You know, every set. Now, especially now, we must seize our role in the formation of our national characters, especially among the young, who are increasingly subjected to a bombardment of sensation instead of the digestion of experience. And in a time of onerous immigration law and mounting warfare, and if you come to the United States, increasing announcements that say, ladies and gentlemen, report suspicious individuals to the authorities nearest you. 
in a time when we're asked to look at one another with hostility and fear and suspicion. The arts, whatever we do, convene our fellow human beings and invite us to look at one another with generosity and curiosity. God knows if we have ever needed that capacity in human history, we need it now. I salute all of you as social activists doing as you do, work in your communities to increase tolerance and empathy and generosity and curiosity. I promise you the hand of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation is extended to you both now and for years to come. And I thank you for your kindness and your patience in listening to me this afternoon. Thank you and Godspeed.